good evening everyone and welcome to our Blacks and Futures speaker series. This evening we are joined by Christine Boynet who is a bioinformatician and we'll be talking about her job, her career and sort of how she got to where she is now. Um, just before we start, um, I think most of the people who are joining us this evening have probably joined us before, but in case anyone's new, um, I'll quickly let you know how the session is going to work. Um, so all of our events we host are here to help us explore STEM and genomics more broadly and what it means for our lives. So we ask you all to be respectful in asking questions this evening um, and myself and Fran are here to make sure that the space is moderated and safe for everybody. Um, if you've not used Zoom webinar before, um, you will see that you can't use your camera or your microphone this evening. So if you need to get in touch with us, um, you can use the chat box um, or the Q&A to um, ask us any questions. If you've got any technical issues, we'll try and help you. Um, and you can use the Q&A button to submit questions to Christine that we'll ask at the end of the session. So any questions about anything on her slides, but her career more generally, pop them in the Q&A and we'll ask them at the end. We'll also be using polls as well, so they'll jump up on your screen and ask you a multiple choice question. Um, I know that if you're watching on mobile, sometimes the polls are hard to see. So if you can't see the poll, you can just type an answer in the chat box as well. That's absolutely fine. Um, next Wednesday, we have our first uh, Genomics Futures Student Symposium that's completely online and is a whole day of like careers and uh, genomics and biology based activities. So um, if you're joining us as part of the Youth Summer Award programme, this can count up to five hours of shaping your future. Um, the registration link is on screen and I'll pop it in the chat box and in the Eventbrite email as well so that you have that. Um, but if you're looking to boost your hours, um, that would be a really easy way of uh, getting more information about lots of different careers in genomics. I think that's everything um, I was going to add. Uh, again, if you're here as part of our Black STEM Futures programme and if there's any topics you want to hear uh, a speaker talk about, let us know either in the comment in the in the chat box today or you can email us with any uh, suggestions. But for now, I will stop sharing um, and I will pass over to Christine to tell us more about her career. Cool, thank you. Um, okay, so now <laughs> my Zoom keeps uh, doing strange things with sharing the stream. Maybe, hold on, it's changed. This is not how I meant it. <laughs> um, maybe, Em, can we do go back to you sharing the screen? Because I can't see. Yeah, no problem. Can... Yeah. Sorry about that. Two seconds just to find my share screen button again. Yeah, mine's completely good. Awesome. Hopefully, you can see the screen now. Perfect. Yes, that's great. Um, sorry about that. Um, um, and in saying that, I will also take off this, then hopefully, my Zoom should be a bit more stable. Thank you so much, Em, for, for doing this. Um, so yeah, I'm Christine. I'm a principal bioinformatician at the Wellcome Science Institute in Cambridge, but I live in London. Um, but if we go on to the next slide, in fact, I kick off immediately with a poll. Um, I was wondering, um, just could you list what your favourite STEM subject is, um, and just so that I get a feel of the room and, and get to understand what um, what you like, uh, your favourite one as well. You might, have, you might love all of them, but favourite of all of them. Got a bit of a mix. Biology is winning, which uh, probably makes sense for today's talk. But we've got uh, a chemistry lover and an economics lover as well. Oh, great! So lots of biologists. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> great. Um, so I can't see the poll results as well. So thanks um, for for telling me <laughs> that. Um, great. We've got lots of biologists because uh, yeah, mine is a purely heavily biology um, focused career. Um, so but welcome. Um, if we go to the next slide, M. There's also another question. I was wondering um, also just to get a feel from the room uh, at which what has what level of education is tempting you most and um, IGCSE is right through to PhD. You may not have an answer, you don't need to have an answer. I'm just curious um, to understand more about you as people in the room. So we've got one person that's definitely looking at A-levels, we've got one person that's interested in doing a bachelor's degree, we've got a couple of people who are interested in doing PhDs as well, so quite uh, quite a mix, so I think your, your story will uh, be useful for a lot of people. 
Oh, great. I mean, I'm very impressed with, um, I, have, I don't know your ages, but but some of you are already thinking of a PhD. I'll be honest, I, I didn't. A PhD sort of was a, was a natural progression, but I, I think maybe I knew I'd, when I was doing my undergrad about a PhD, but I'll kind of go into that a bit more. Um, next slide, please, Anne. Um, so this is just a bit of a diagram of a oh, little bit of my pathway into what's happened in my career so far and what the what milestones I've hit. Um, so the linear line is actually just uh, essentially my career and where it's taken path. But you can see there's two branches, the one at the bottom detailing my training and public engagement. So that I, I kind of started and really have stayed doing it since about 2015 and i'll talk a bit about that and then in the other branch is a, a podcast branch so i started a podcast um uh, in early well late 2019 early 2020 with a wonderful team of uh, other women in stem and we're called the sensational six so i'll talk a bit about that and 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 mainly focus on my linear progression of my career thanks sam next slide um, so I'm originally from Kenya, uh, I should say I was born in Kenya and lived there for um, about 20 years, uh, well 16, I left Kenya at 16, but Kenya is a really wonderful and beautiful country, it's full of the big five, you can see there there's the lion, the cheetah, zebra, elephants, those are my favorite, there's rhino as well, but there's also rich in culture and people, if you just click to the next thing, um, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me. <coughs> Um, it's fairly known for uh, the Maasai culture, and those are like the most famous, but also our runners are really, really, they're like our, form, our former celebrities in Kenya, and they like dominate the marathon runners, but the two for most famous exports are Lupita Nyong'o and um, Barack Obama's dad is actually Kenyan, so just a little bit of a fun fact there. Thank you, Em. Um, to begin, so in high school, it took me, I had to remember what exact subjects I did. I did uh, nine international GCSEs and international GCSEs are just ones that um, they're slightly different in curriculum, but uh, they have encompassed the same thing, but I just thought I should mention that. Um, and they were largely science based, well, there should be a comma there, I apologize, and geography. I really love geography as a subject. And then obviously, obviously did English Lit and, and language as compulsory, but I also did drama and art. I loved drama and I love acting and I'll, I'll tell you what, it does come into to use drama in presenting because you have to have, you know, a little stage presence when you're presenting at conferences and I think drama, my kind of training in drama and doing in Lambda helped a lot in getting that confidence in that you sort of embody somebody else for a second to get that confidence to be able to present. And then I went, moved on, I got a scholarship to come to the UK to do my A-levels, an academic scholarship. And there I did, um, at the time they were doing AS and A-level, I think that's still in existence. So that's maths, biology, chemistry on my full A-levels. And then I did geography. Now, the reason I was going to um, do four A-levels, four I mean, that's overreaching. I think these days you guys can easily do four A-levels, but uh, geography was quite an intense, geography and biology are quite intense in terms of, um, the amount of reading that you had to do and I think at the point I started geography and I as an A level and then I dropped it after um I dropped it after a, a term because it was just a lot of intense work and a lot of reading and writing afterwards so uh, to be able to to get the wonderful grades that I got at A level I, st I stuck with the three um sciences um oh I should also yeah that's it thanks Em next slide um Internships, I think internships are really, really useful. And for me, they'll help me secure uh, my places at BSc, but also it looks great um, thereafter that I did internships in my summer. So I did one from high school into A-levels that summer. And I did this at Camry at the Kenya Medical Research Institute in Nairobi. And there was just a rotation project. So I went to the malaria department, the HIV, and also the clinical team. And where the clinical team was an interesting one, I was looking at, well, it's the team where they collect fecal samples and then you you kind of plate it and look for um, typhoid, basically, mainly typhoid. But um, it wasn't too far from my actual PhD in that I was looking at fecal samples in um, CAT also. I kind of got used to that. And then in the summer of A-levels to BSc, I did, I went back to Camry and I did 
I did another rotation in the HIV department and I was doing the more molecular side. So I didn't get training into category three till a bit later, but I was looking at more the molecularology. But what I liked it about that, I was young, but also it, it gives you a lot of time to see the feel of the lab. So I do recommend if you are planning to, to, to embark on a PhD or especially if it's an, a scientific a st in STEM, maybe have a have a have one of your internships in a lab because a really good way to kind of understand how to how you work in the lab and that transition into the office and lab. Thank you. Next slide. Um, so I, after doing my A-levels, I managed to get into, and I had this discussion before we started with M. Um, uh, I applied to five universities and I was very uh, glad that I got into all five, or that I, I, but I only accepted obviously the place in one. And the reason for choosing um, Imperial was one I was based in London and I really enjoy living in London and my sisters at the time were in London uh, but also too I like the program that they were choosing so as I said my favorite subjects were biology and chemistry and I went for the simplest form which is bio biochemistry it is not a combination of the two as you can see biochemistry um, in undergrad it's really heavily focused on kind of the chemistry of biology. So I did lots of protein chemistry and enzyme kinetics, which I still use to this day. Molecular biology and cell biology, those are actually slightly two different things. Molecular biology is more like DNA and proteins, where cell biology, you're looking at kind of the nucleus and um, mitochondria and things. So you're sort of understanding how the biology of the cell works. Um, and then I think into a second year, we did a little bit of neurochemistry. Um, and my final year did some infectious disease and also a bit of biotech and my favorite topic, which is immunology. I know it's weird, I never went into immunology, but it was a really nice, um, nicely presented and the lecturer was awesome. One thing I will say when you're looking at undergraduate degrees is to look at their teaching program. So Imperial is heavily on, on, on research. Um, at the time I was doing my, my undergrad, they were transitioning from heavy teaching to more research. So I think you have to get a, a strike a good balance. Either you go to a, a heavy teaching um, school, like uh, Birmingham is I think a very good heavy and they've got a nice balance or you go to more of a research one and Imperial is, is and, and UCL, they've got a really nice balance, but you have to look at the program um, they offer. Don't be like me and just think you can stick to A-level subjects and get a degree. Um, it's, it's a little bit more technical than that. Um, I also opted after my first year to do a year in industry. One, um, I, I thought it would give me an advantage at applying for jobs and also going into a PhD, having to sit in a year, do a whole project and write it up, which was a phenomenal experience. I, I moved to um, Stevenage in GSK. And again, I did um, uh, it was working on sequencing HIV gag proteins and gag protein is just controls. If I recall, this is going to be an interesting, it controls the uh, one of the proteins that stick on the outside. So it's, it's it, immunologically, it's a very important um, protein. Um, and that's where I got my lab experience in working in a category three. So when you work in a lab, there's uh, three categories. There's category one, which is just working with the bench and DNA. So it doesn't require any, um, you need to have gloves, but the protection is slightly lower than the category two, which is what I normally work with. It would be with working with actual live cells like E. coli, but things that are could be infectious, but are not particularly um, infectious, but you still still have to have all your PPE and everyone knows now PPE. So you need a lab coat and your gloves um, and still very school. And the risk assessment for that is slightly higher. And then category three is now very infectious agents like HIV and typhoid. And that is, um, it's a very specific type of lab that has a different specific airflow system. And you have to get um, certified in, in to be work in a category three lab. I've never quite worked in a category four. Category four would be something like Ebola. Um, so that's where it's super, super infectious. Uh, thank you, Em. Next slide. So one of the things I wanted to give you a bit of background is some, um, some tips for the undergrad. One, um, meet people. And one thing it would absolutely help you and it's, it's, it helps you with networking later on. And I say this because when you first go into um, 
undergrad, all of you are the same space, like first year and freshman, freshman week, all of you have started at exactly the same point, no one knows each other, or if they do, they're very lucky. So it's a really good way to start to meet people, know that other people are really shy like you. So this is a, it's a really good way to start to get to know. And one of the things, networking is almost a bad word sometimes to some people, because you can't avoid networking in your later on in life, in your working life, you have to. And I think creating that social, that feel that is not as awkward anymore. Everyone feels awkward. Um, so uh, it's a good way to practice this and get that shyness. And you could have two different personalities, as I said, and if you do drama, you also know, that, you know, just be yourself and be interesting. The other thing is first year of undergrad is normally, I think some, most, some universities, they their first year doesn't count or it counts to towards 5%. So Imperial was a 5% count. And don't think it's, it seems insignificant in, if you're doing a whole three years and the latter two years are like, you know, uh, heavier weighted. But what I, I'll give you advice for is, you know, first year have fun, but also use it as your transition year. So it's a different way of working in the sense of, you know, you have gone from a six hour day or eight hour day at school to you might have lectures for two hours or four hours a day. The rest of the day is not for free time to go and enjoy and sleep and watch Netflix. But I would suggest you get into the habit of going to the library and writing up your notes because sometimes you write, have to write them shorthand. Uh, or if you're typing them up, you're still typing shorthand. If the lecturer um, doesn't have any slides or doesn't have uh, very annotated slides. It depends again on which university you go to. So get used to going back into the library and just reading and you don't have to have like work a full a day a full hour day but I would suggest you do that because the workload becomes incredible like it's almost double if not triple um in second year and your final year so you, you you'd have to do it anyway in your second year but to get into that habit in your first year is a really good idea um do join clubs and societies I've listed those new clubs and societies um, there on the right from Imperial join clubs and you can meet so many people and have such great friendships and I still have you know long-term friends uh friendships from the clubs that I did join at Imperial um and I did join the Afro-Caribbean Society that was always fun we did lots of dancing and shows and it was always it was good good, fun, great people who become rightfully successful in their own light. So it's good people to know. Um, and one thing I would say is be kind to yourself. When you first go into university, that first, first maybe month is really hard because you've just, you're moving, you're essentially living alone, you're learning to cook. So you, you'll add that, you know, freshers five kilos or whatever they say. But be really kind to yourself. Know that, you know, you have to ask, ask for help and know that everyone's in the name book, but it's, it's, people are there to help you and I think I would say first seek out that get a really nice system and allow yourself time to rest and don't push yourself too hard which is again why first year doesn't count too much or counts less in your first year really um do that and have fun first year is a really good time and I'd say even through to your third year it's really fun but obviously by the third year you're you're trying to get the grades um next slide Em. thank you um so here, these are not the actual careers that you can go into after, but these are the careers my friends ended up in. So for me, uh, I would say in my group of friends, maybe two of us are, of maybe 10 ended up in academia and I'm the only one still in academia. Uh, a couple of my friends went to medicine, you can go into the pharmaceutical industry, public health labs as well, or go into more epidemiology and public health. Some people left science completely, went into finance. Um, a friend who's very successful now uh, is in public relations. Another friend also very successful doing operations in um, a company that does hospitality. So it's kind of like Airbnb. But yeah, the, 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 the possibilities are endless. Um, so it's don't feel that you have to be confined to do biochemistry for the rest of your life. Um, next slide, Em. Um, this is another question. Um, so this is a, a picture I did have at the beginning. Uh, do you know what this molecule is? So we'll put up the, the poll and you can decide. It's a really beautiful image. So there should be a poll on your screen, but for anyone who's just joined us, if you can't see the poll and want to join in, you can type an answer in the chat box as well. Twizzlers. <laughs> yeah, so most people are going for DNA. One person's gone for Twizzlers, which um, 
I enjoy I enjoyed his answer on your slides. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I put this on because I was I asked I was writing this question and I, I I couldn't think of a fourth thing and Twizzlers do twist like that and you know if I colored this red it would be like a Twizzler so you know nice nice joke um next slide Em, I think I do reveal the answer in the next slide um so it is DNA congratulations to everybody and thank you to the Twizzler fan that's really fun fact um next slide uh, I wanted to give you another example. So this is uh, something I learned in biochemistry um, first year. Most images that you see, or kind of, you know, artsy, arty images you see in the web or public, uh, apart from textbooks, they are actually wrong. That's that picture, it's moving. The, the DNA molecule is left-handed and that is incorrect. So that's, you know, on the slide, on the, slide, on the picture on the right, uh, this is, you and Bernie from EBI put this up on Twitter and it's a really nice picture and showing that they actually should be right-handed. So the twist should be right-handed. And the way they described it is if thumb is this way and that's left, but I just use my hands to show me. So the most images are actually wrong with DNA. That's not real DNA molecule. I think it's, they sometimes describe the Z DNA. Thank you, um, I'm correct. <laughs> so after my, um, undergrad, I really enjoyed infectious disease as my third year module, and I really wanted to focus on it. So biochemistry is, is really heavy on, quite heavy on the maths, but also the chemistry of it. Uh, and I really wanted to do infectious diseases. I, I have no other reason for saying that I just really enjoy how germs work. I, I really do. It, it's really fascinating. In fact, so uh, I did, I applied to London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and I did molecular biology and infectious diseases. Um, as you know, from my internship and also my year in industry, I really love virology. Viruses are really interesting. In fact, I do have a favorite virus, which is the herpes simplex virus. And why I really like it, because it's a very clever little thing. Uh, so viruses, technically, it's a very contentious issue. They're not living technically, but also it could be so... Uh, however you think of it, because a living thing needs to respire and, and um, procreate. Uh, but viruses don't, they just propagate, they don't procreate. Um, but viruses, what help you simplex virus is really clever. So when you get a cold sore, and you can, you know, let's say you kiss somebody or whatever, you get the cold sore, but the, that's the virus being active and showing on your skin. But as soon as your immune system recognizes it and tries to eliminate it, the virus just stops being infectious and runs up into your nervous system and there's no immune cells in your nervous system so that's where you end up living with it for the rest of your life and then it just when your immunity drops a little bit the virus comes out propagates and then runs back up but to hide as soon as um, your immune system catches on so it's a really clever thing but also in that course we covered a lot of bacteriology parasitology and statistics so maths never really leaves you uh, but you know, there's really cool programs that can help you with that. But it's it's you need to a little bit basic understanding of stats. But they do cover it quite well. Uh, so I did an MSc project that, uh, which is essentially a summer project. I think it's three months, if I can recall, it's about three months. And I did it again in HIV, but at UCL this time, and still looking at the gag and pole region of HIV. Very interesting virus, I think. Uh, but I also was a recipient of Ralph Neal Memorial Prize, which I was like the top student of the molecular biology of infectious diseases. Yeah, so that was really exciting um, to get that. And again, another thing, the, the prizes really work um, towards, it shows that you're consistently trying and achieving what you want to do. And then when it comes to jobs, even applying for jobs, this is, you know, I did my master's well over six years ago. Uh, she's going to be more like 10 now. But it, it, the, the prizes still come up because it shows you're trying to constantly achieve. And one of the things when you're applying for jobs is show, not tell. So things like prizes and awards or places you present, that really is showing rather than just telling people, oh, I, you know, I did a master's and stuff. And obviously achieving it is part of showing. Thank you, Em. Next slide. Um, another question. Uh, uh, I wanted to ask this general in the room, if you had a cold, what should you treat it with? An antiviral, antibiotic, antifungal, antiparasitic, or just rest and fluids? Um, I'm really curious to know the, uh, the answer to this. I'll give everyone a second to, to pop their ideas on the poll. 
So rest and fluids is winning at the moment. It's got three votes, but um, antiviral medicines also have uh, a couple of votes as well. Great, thanks. And um, we'll go to uh, the full finish before I move on. Yeah. To okay, great. If we go to the next slide, uh, the middle. So one, one thing uh, I'm glad most people did put antiviral as well because I didn't say quite what caused it, but. Uh, I'll pick here specifically rhinovirus is the most popular one that gives you a cold. And the reason um, it's rest and fluids, in fact, a rhinovirus, it doesn't really respond to antiviral. So you shouldn't really get anything for a rhinovirus or common cold, it's rest and fluids um, because the antiviral almost does nothing. And that's just making your liver work a bit harder for something that um, isn't uh, necessarily going to take you there. If you've got comorbidities, for example, asthma, you may get support for that. So, you know, you get steroids to to lessen the inflammation in your lungs. But if you're just healthy and a young individual, it's rest and fluids. Um, but if you put up, I think I have a little comedy on the next, if you click um, M. Right. <laughs> this is a really nice cartoon that I use in my public engagement. I mean, I shouldn't, violence, I do not condone violence. But this is Batman and Robin. And, you know, Robin starts saying, I think I need antibiotics for my, and he gets a slap because antibiotics, and I'm glad no one said that, but antibiotics are used to treat bacterial infections. Um, which can extend, the, there's some caveats for, it might have some sort of antifungal activity for some, but it's mainly, you don't use antibiotics for a cold. Thank you, Em. Next slide. Um, after my master's, I, uh, this I think goes back into social engineering. I emailed one of my tutors from my undergrad and I wanted to do a PhD. I couldn't find one. Well, I applied for one, but uh, because I was still an overseas student, um, I couldn't get that PhD, it was in atherosclerosis. But uh, one of my, my undergrad supervisors, after contacting him and asking him if he had space in Zabin, no, he's like, I don't, but I know a friend who's looking, uh, who's holding PhD interviews. So I submitted my application and I got called for an interview. And, uh, this was in the, at the time called the VLA, which is now called Animal and Plant Health Agency, which is a government agency. It, it, it looks at, um, it's essentially like PHE, but for animals, you look at um, infectious diseases in animals and report back. So it's mainly for the farming community, but it was also because they're not accredited university, we were associated with Royal Holloway <laughs> University of London. Um, unfortunately, I only went there a total of five times, I think, uh, one of them being the day that I was examined for my PhD. So, um, and they did support it through um, kind of soft skills and other skills and arts. But for example, it was one thing about the PhD is what it's really, for me, it was lab based, but depending on what type of PhD you do. So if you do a computing science PhD style, obviously the lab would be your laptop. Uh, the main thing about the PhD is really it's self-driving and really teaches you so many things. One is especially is time management. You learn it very well. You get really good. And when employers look when you do a PhD, it's PhD is, is basically a way of showing you do have analytical skills, but you can also get that at um, at any um, level of schooling you do. Uh, get a lot of practice in presenting because you have to present at conferences, you have to present in the lab. So it becomes almost a weekly thing that you present. And then a lot of writing skills, because first of all, the PhD in itself, you have to write a thesis, um, which is a, a substantial bit of writing, uh, but also publish papers. Um, so that's mainly of the things. And maybe you can write blogs and stuff. Uh, next slide. Um, I want to give you a bit of a background of what I actually did in my PhD. So I look at uh, bacteria, so that's my main focus. And we're looking at resistance and how these can be transferred between strains. And because, you know, for example, if one cow gets sick, sometimes you can spread it quite quickly in a herd. So this is why you need to treat. But the reason why bacteria are kind of cool with resistance is that sometimes there's ways, there's three different methods of transmitting resistance. I mean, there's, I won't talk about the vertical transmission, but this is more horizontal transmission. And some bacteria, and this is, I think, especially true for streptococcus pneumonia, which gives you a upper uh, low respiratory tract infection, DNA can just be released into the ether when it, for example, one bacteria dies, and then those pieces of DNA, another strep pneumo can just pick it up and then import it to its cell. And that's what Emma is showing you lovely with the, the arrows there. Thank you for that animation. In the second one, the transduction. So there's this specific 
bacteria have their own viruses that infect them and these are known as phage and those phage that look like those little robotic arms and they're cool in a sense because they can transfer the dna capture it they kind of infect a bacterial cell um, and then take up back the dna and then transport it to another cell so they're kind of a form of transduction but what they can also do is they can incorporate themselves into the chromosome um, very cool way and phage is actually used um, it's a typing scheme so you can for especially for e coli and salmonella you can see that you've acquired DNA from an exogenous source or an external source which is the phage um, and the third and final one, which is my favorite and what the focus of my PhD is, I think if you click M, I've kind of highlighted it um, into a picture, I think something else should come up. So I did conjugation and uh, mainly that what it is, and it's again a really cool piece. So you've got your chromosome that controls the cell, essentially replication, respiration, living things. And then this plasmid is like another source of DNA that is acquired from externally, a different cell. And what happens, it can start to capture just on its own capture resistance genes from other cells. So as it, as it transfers across to a new and recipient cell, it can then scope around for what resistance does it wants, goes shopping and this keeps accumulating and can these can get very large. And the picture on on the right there was a plasmid that I had. It's a really, really successful plasmid. It's called Inkef. It has a lot of genes and, and it's it's essentially a piece of work on its own, but it's, it's very large, but has, I think this one had about 13 different resistance genes, meaning you'd fail, if you treated somebody with that, you'd fail about four different classes of antibiotics. So it's a really bad, it, it, clinically it's terrible to get, um, but then it's a really interesting way that it just keeps, adding to its genetic material and plasmids never stop evolving, right? Uh, they just keep acquiring. So it's also really hard to say, oh, this plasmid is the same one that was here last year. No, it just keeps accumulating and you can get very sick with these plasmids. These are actually really the most problematic things when you look at ICU infections because they hang around hospitals. Hospitals have uh, drugs and antibiotics. And the more you treat something, these bugs just get smarter and try and acquire new resistances. So, and this is why, you know, antimicrobial resistance is really truly the next uh, public, big public health issue that we're facing at the moment. Um, next slide. So the perks of a PhD, I, there's a lot of blood, sweat and tears that goes into the PhD. And I don't mean like knife fights. So for example, the blood for me, I used to cycle to work and um, or to my PhD. And, uh, you know, I've had a couple accidents, fell, scraped my knee. And that was the blood. The sweat was also the cycle, some tears. But they're not bad tears. You really form some really, really strong bonds with people because it's almost like being a type of, I don't know, you're just entrenched together and, and going through the same processes. So, and like I said, you get a lot of um, experience in time management because you have to manage your own time. There's no one telling you, you have to you know, work, you have to give me this particular thing. All you're given is the first year you do a, a, a thesis report and then your final is your thesis and defense. And those are really the only guys. Your PhD supervisor here is super, super important. So if you're thinking of going for a PhD and for the people in the room that want to go for a PhD, uh, picking your supervisor is as important as picking your project. It's somebody that you also should be able to get along with because this is a, a type of bond with your supervisor is, I'm sorry, the alarm is going off. It should go off in a bit, but that bond you form with your supervisor is almost it's you wouldn't be able to do it if you don't get on with your supervisor it's very very hard so i do recommend when you go for a period and i wish somebody had told me this but I, you know luckily i got very lucky and, and had some great supervisors but it's something you have to look for look for the supervisor the lab if you like the lab if you have a lot of support by postdocs by and this i mean more senior people that have done phds because more uh, more often than not, they are the ones who will daily supervise you and maybe give you protocols to help you kind of sup supersede that. Uh, the other thing you learn to design and plan projects. So even if you want to leave after a PhD and go into project management, you you you're able to plan a project essentially. Uh, one of the great things I've highlighted there is in the images like conferences. You get to go to all these 
lovely conferences because it's part of your training to go to these conferences and then I have the Netherlands in Italy because I'm, I was able to go and visit labs and work there so I was in Italy for a month in Rome and then I had two weeks in um Honing, no it was in Groningen or Utrecht somewhere in the Netherlands it's the middle of nowhere but it was still really good fun um, and again as I said you have lifelong friendships I wish I had pictures but my laptop was stolen so I don't have any images but um next slide please Oh, I did have, that was just one. Uh, this is great fun, PhD comics. If you do a PhD, do dive into uh, PhD comics. It's really funny because it, it really describes what you do. And here it just says, you know, you read, you write your, you need to read lots of papers and you need to write your paper and then you need to rinse, which in this sense is lots of coffee. Um, I developed a terrible coffee habit and then you repeat all this again and it's just really funny because you're almost a little bit drained but it's still so fun and phd comics makes it a really fun experience um next slide then so uh, up to now i've kind of talked about my schooling and now moving on to and a postdoc is a type of training contract and so i'm going to move on into that but i'm also just showing you quickly how you describe it in a cv so when you're in school, you write the year you graduated or you attained your, your PhD, MSc, BSc. But then when you start working, it's the day you, like, you start. So when you started that contract. So this is why it looks like there is an overlap. And there is an overlap. If you went to Divya's talk last time, uh, she was doing her postdoc at the same time finishing her PhD and didn't recommend it. I also did about six months of that was full-time working and there was nothing to do with my project, but also doing my PhD, writing up my PhD at night. Uh, it was a terrible six months and I don't recommend anyone do that. But at the time, and to be honest, the reason I did this, Royal Holloway, I think they've stopped this now, but they it was a three-year contract. And now I think it's standard to give PhD four years. So it's three year actual in the lab and one year writing. But uh, the three years was up, you are no longer a student and you had to pay council tax. And I, my, my savings didn't quite that. So I needed to get a job almost immediately so I could be able to afford to, to pay council tax and rent, but also write my PhD. So um, I just did, I decided to go into employment as a, or into a postdoc straight after. Um, so I think, so I'll just kind of talk through my first postdoc, which is at Sanger. Um, so as you can tell, it's not, I've not been at Sanger the whole time, but I've sort of come back to Sanger, but this was my first time into Cambridge. It was really exciting. And one of the thing is, towards the end of my PhD, I did do some um, sequencing, so genomic sequencing, and Sanger is really a world leader, especially in Europe, of genomic sequencing, so to get into it was great, um, and uh, was looking at transposon directed mutagenesis, which is a specific way of looking at resistance genes um, that are unknown, essentially, so most of the times we do have a catalog or database of known resistance genes, but this was looking for unknown ones, which is very cool. Uh, so I learned, I got lots of training in very technical stuff in bioinformatics. I don't know if you've come across it, but it's essentially as it sounds, it's biological and ICT, basically tech like computing. It's putting those two and getting biological information from data. I may have a, a definition in the next slide but so and and one of these things the things that i was really and gained, gained a lot of experience is collaboration so again networking comes really into play but you also create natural collaboration and just because of the work you meet somebody you go to a conference you see what they're doing and you're like oh i can apply to that so you then go and talk to them afterwards and you know some of these resulted in great collaborations and and great papers thereafter you present again the presenting never stops so if you don't like presenting i think it's a tough one you have to just keep doing it but i will say this the more you present the easier uh, it feels and becomes you know at the beginning i would spend you know to take me maybe a week to write slides and I, i'd have to go through it so many times but you know with time and experience it becomes much faster uh, going to conferences is always exciting you go to really nice places um so that's also a real perk uh, one of the other things I described and I'll talk to you later is teaching. I started teaching at this point, and this is teaching professionals in bioinformatics and also doing public engagement talks. And then I learned lots of computing. So now I, you know, I, I can script and I work in Linux based systems. And this is also a very useful transferable skill. Um, next slide, please. Then. Um, so yeah, 
I did write this dictionary. So this, uh, the definition of bioinformatics is essentially the science of collecting and analyzing data, biological data into uh, such as genetic codes. And that's just the definition of the English, of the, in the dictionary. But for example, if you ask him, what is, what's the point of this? This is just a picture of uh, animal king, oh, sort of animal kingdom, or kingdom essentially, the classification system. So take any species or genus or family of, of organisms or people, um, and then if you click on the next thing, M, I think it's all click based, <laughs> you then get the biological information, the data. So this is now your ACTG code, which is your genetic code, which is what DNA is made up of. And then you, uh, this is now where the real bioinformatics comes in and you be able to manipulate and understand the data to be able to give you an output. And this is what we call the phenotype. So here, different mutations can result in different phenotypes by that what it looks like so on the left is a dinosaur i think this is a core cop so that, that's the dinosaur name there and it's scaled and then if you have a particular mutation it might result in feather like uh, experience and then if you combine those two you get a, a sort of a chimera of the two of the, the scaled and also feathered uh, but yeah so this is the really cool things you can do um next slide then but then, uh, you know, there's real life consequences. And I just looked at the news I, yesterday. I was just looking at um, the news of anything genomics -y that has been useful. And again, we've finally been able to close the human genome gap. Uh, and this is really good and interesting. It has such con great con consequences for understanding how cancer works because sometimes mutations that cause cancer are in these regions that were almost we had gaps in. So data gaps are really a a big problem but closing it finally can really maybe help people who have uh, mutations in certain genes and rare diseases uh, the other thing as you've known genomic sequencing has been really the forefront of fighting covid and to understand how it moves so this i think here was a of it's from the new delhi uh, the hindu which is in india and deciding uh, they've used it to kind of track the delta variant um, and then moving on from that also is just a way of also tracking population and bacteria. So you can do this with bacteria, tracking populations of viruses, and they do this with flu. Uh, same with also populations of animals. Thank you. Next slide, then. Uh, another question, just so I haven't bored you to death. What information can you um, get or predict from genome sequencing? Oh, I think we've got an answer there, but no one needs to know, but that's it. Um, Sorry, the poll button has disappeared. Fran, are you able to pop this poll up for us? Yeah. There we go. Yeah. So, be, yeah, what can you get from genome sequencing? What, what type of information? Either most people saw my accent the click through or um or they just know quite a bit about genome sequencing everyone's going for all of the above excellent <laughs> that's like that's fantastic exactly so you can get a lot of um, information from that which is physiological traits as i explained before drug resistance protein sequence and protein obviously you go from dna to rna to protein um and then yeah track population so well done guys um thank you uh, next slide uh, so my first, after my first postdoc, I went into a bacterial geneticist uh, post, and this is again back to travel. So one of our collaborators that I worked with in my first postdoc, uh, we met for coffee, and he knew my contract was coming up at Sanga, and he's like, "Hey, do you want to come to Viet live in Vietnam for a couple of years?" And I jumped at the chance. One, it was a whole new culture for me and whole new language. I do know some Vietnamese. Fun fact, the structure of Vietnamese is exactly the same as Swahili, so I speak fluent Swahili. So learning Vietnamese and also some tones uh, uh, were, were similar and able to carry through. The other thing you have to write a lot. So again, writing is, is if, you're, if you want to pursue academia, writing becomes uh, almost a pastime. Um, and also now one of the other things you could, I got from this was managing multiple projects across time zones. So first of all, multiple projects, because you've got, you're collaborating with so many people, but also across time zones. So I had collaborators at the time in the US and I'm in Vietnam. So it was almost like a, a night time. We'd have to swap over and have calls at um, some ridiculous times, but 
it's only for a short period and we, we stuck to emails for, for the most part. Um, uh, and again, lots of travel. So I managed to travel in the region. I think I piloted a few, but I was working in Vietnam, but also managed to travel to Cambodia, Laos, um, and Thailand, of course, uh, which is where one of our collaborators was and still is, those are still my lifelong friends. So this was at Okru, the Oxford Clinical Research Unit um, in Ho Chi Minh City um, in Vietnam. Um, next slide. Um, and then after that, I managed that contract ended and I came, moved back to the UK. So it's very sad I came back to the UK, but I went back to Oxford for six months where I worked with, uh, again, it's a contact who also knew my, my boss at, in Vietnam. And for here, it was a really different team. So I was the only uh, genobiologist on the, on the team. Everyone else was pretty much modelers, mathematical modelers, and they were modeling global disease burden. Um, and for me, I was just, uh, for them, for me, I was be able to, my job, my role, and I think Emma, I have that in the next slide, actually. Thank you. Uh, so my role was to have, give them a sort of biological understanding and to, for anything that was inexplicable. So for example, we had, they had samples and we're looking at global disease burden of typhi, looking at samples from the 90s to um, 2018. But what we found from this was actually, it, it looked like resistance was going down or they couldn't explain it because of the typing scheme but what it was is a plasmid was actually circulating in typhi so typhi for a long time looked like it had the same resistances it was very static very infectious but in terms of resistance uh, nothing too major but then in 2016 we started to see an increase of uh, resistant typhi which was really interesting because after so long you know typhi was fairly stable but suddenly became very resistant to drugs. And it's because it acquired resistance in a particular, um, well, plasma, but also in the chromosome to uh, the treatment, the main drug treatment of choice, which is um, superfloxacin. Um, and yeah, it's really unfortunate, but yeah, this is, a, this is also ongoing, um, but yeah. The, the ones in red are really the places where this it's circulating in those regions, but it was a really interesting time. But uh, about six months into, obviously, just before I left, I got a really amazing uh, opportunity at Sanger now, which is my current role. Um, thank you. Next slide. Oh, I did ex go into more explanation, but I, I just talked about it. it was a specific plasma circulating. And then I got this uh, incredible job uh, of doing what I, I really find passion is training um, biomedicians in bioinformatics, I train professionals. Uh, when I say professional research professionals in uh, bioinformatics. And for that, I got to have project management and product management. So those are two, they sound similar, but they're not quite. So project is the kind of manage the operations of the project, but the product is essentially for me would be the training and producing that training and the, uh, the website is a product. Uh, one of the other things I've learned quite heavily and was really useful in this uh, particular job is learning about different computing environments. And by this, I mean, you know, we get our laptop, that is a, a particular operating system, but then to build these computers behind it, the back end, there's different ways you can host um, data. Uh, and you've got to understand what the pros and cons of each of them when you're handling and training people in this. The other thing is effective communication skills because I train, um, I think we're up to 140 different people in our training for this specific job. Um, and for that, I also have to lead this and, and manage upwards to my boss. Uh, another really cool thing in this job, I've had to learn HTML and CSS, which are website to, uh, sort of languages, which is really cool. So I'm really excited about that. Um, thanks, Sam. Next slide. Um, so again, this is another slide that I'll never keep uh, telling you is this, uh, don't stop cultivating your networks. And again, these to do that, it's not a, a frivolous thing, but also you have to be genuine. I think when you be, be genuine being yourself, you can really get create and get some really lifelong friends. And I can tell you, even I've shown you just the picture there, a lot of my experience, I've, I've gained very strong friendships and I keep uh cultivating these friendships as i go along and they've been very useful either you know just giving for asking for advice going for a coffee it's really great or seeing them at a conference and be like oh how are you you know and, and things so i i never negate the what your social network can be useful for you and also not just useful but it just makes science really fun to be able to go to 
if I go to Washington tomorrow, I can email someone, one of my colleagues and say, I'm in Washington, let's go for a coffee. So just a note on cultivating networks. Uh, next slide. Um, ooh, I'll just watch time because I'm, I think we're, I'll try and zoom through. So the next part is just talking about my public engagement and professional public engagement and more training that I've been undergoing. Thank you. And next slide. Um, so with that, I've been teaching uh, an online course, which actually after this, I'm getting off this call and going into facilita facilitating one of our, our online courses. And for this, you know, we uh, we reach quite a large range of learners, and these are from introduction, like introductory to people who are, let's say, nurses or doctors going into sort of more data analysis. And they're really nice uh, little courses that we've sort of set up on FutureLearn in partnership with Welcome Connecting Science. I also teach a face-to-face -face course, and uh, up to date, taught about 125 learners globally. And then in my Juno GPS training, I teach about 3,000 people. I've reached about 3,000 oh, 3, people. But thank you. Next, next slide, Anne. Um, so this is another question or poll time. Um, I was wondering if um, you're more or less intrigued, sorry, I should be intrigued by health tech or genomic sequencing after my talk. I think I'm coming to the end of this. So if you could just say more or less, or you don't really care. So most people are putting more, we've got one person who is the same, so that maybe they were interested before and they're still interested, but most people are saying that they're more interested now. Oh, that's good, that's great. This is maybe just for me to enjoy and uh, hopefully they reached the top and I'm going to be able to feed back to, to, my, to my manager that yes, this wasn't really interesting and hopefully um, inspired a few people. Thank you, next slide. Um, so as I said, I started a project, uh, I, I applied for a, it was a competition to improve mentorship in low and middle income countries, and I won uh, the European leg, but that meant I had to actually follow through and write the podcast. So why I chose a podcast, one, I was commuting quite a lot, and I really learn a lot from podcasts, and, and it's really interesting stories. So I decided to set up mentorship and kind of give people a really a skills lab and more skills and, and things like, you know, net, how to network and um, burnout syndrome, which sometimes, you know, people in research do get a bit of burnout. Actually, every, almost every aspect, every job you do get burnout and how to avoid burnout and recognize it. Uh, but it's mainly to target early career, early career researchers. So um, maybe at the high school level might not be very useful, but again, if you have imposter syndrome, that's also we've got an episode on that. Everybody has imposter syndrome wherever you go. Um, and I remember, you know, getting a job in Cambridge and thinking, oh my God, it's Cambridge. But there's always imposter syndrome. You go there and other people always feel, and it's usually the people that are really good have the worst um, imposter syndrome. So really take heed and, and sort of sit in the, your achievements and really walk with that and, and be excited that you've been able to get there and don't don't let it paralyze you. I know it's easier said than done. Uh, but yeah, uh, next slide. Then. So I just wanted to, to say like, you know, one of the things, as I said, is, is measuring impact and showing, not telling. So I, this is the first time I, I didn't, calculate the impact so you know between uh, you can click and show the next image um so the image pops up i didn't realize i did so looking at the training from my you know, online courses my actual individual training and the podcast i'm reaching about you know eighteen thousand to twenty thousand people um to date and this is really exciting for me and um just showing how how you've growing your network and actually a lot of this is being able to email people and say you know we've got this training can you put it on and i think one of my, the biggest achievements and just putting that you can reach quite a lot of people and make uh, i'm really excited that a lot of bioinformaticians will come from this and as you know COVID has shown uh, many hands make light work so when researchers work together to be able to understand how things are moving uh, it's so important to understand um, especially infection outbreaks and how to control it so i really hope you encourage a genomic sequencing um i think there might be a last slide i'm not so sure right yes so this is going back to the first question and really just to understand uh, if you if I've changed your mind, it doesn't have to have changed, and you can just answer again up to where you, you feel. If I've scared you away from the PhD, <laughs> it's really it's fun. It's more fun than I maybe led on, but yeah, just have a think. 
Well, we've still got one person interested in the PhD, so it's either the same person or a new person, and the original person has now been scared off. But at least one person is uh, right. <laughs> thinking yeah, about the PhD. <laughs> It's a great and fun, fun pastime. Uh, but yeah, and I think that might be my last slide. I'm not sure. Oh, yes. Uh, one thing I do, this is just a, a parting shot. One, every experience is an opportunity. So when even one door closes, absolutely look for a window you can go through, right? It's, it, do not think that everything, and, and I liked Marsha, who I think presented a few weeks ago. She said, uh, life is hard and don't always take no for an answer just break through find a way through and also find a positive in everything you do in every job I've come from even if it was maybe something was a bad experience or look for for something you can tend to a positive because problem solving is is a really great transferable skill um, and I think that might be one more slide <laughs> right yes I say breakthrough yes be superman and breakthrough uh, and one of the things uh Michelle Lama says is sometimes you need to go high and not low. And I think that's where you, you need to rise above it. And sometimes you just need to work through and break through any barriers because you can do it and you can really absolutely do it. And a lot of that is convincing yourself you can try and do it. So um, next slide, I think that might be it. <laughs> oh God, I keep saying, yeah, I I've, I've already said most of these, but uh, I just wanted to say again, these are just, you know, thanks to all my supporters. And these are people I've acquired through the years. And every time they're really, I've learned a lot from the people I've, I've, I've listed here. So it'll, it won't stop. Um, thank you. And I think that is definitely my yeah. last <laughs> Okay, <laughs> those are how you can reach me, but definitely that's <laughs> right. Sorry, and I'll open the floor up to questions. I'm sorry I ran a little. Oh, no, it was a really, really interesting um, talk. I'm just trying to exit out of it. Um, so thank you so much for, for all of that detail about all the things you've done in, in your life. So um, we've got a few minutes for questions. So if anyone does have questions for uh, Christine, pop them either in the chat or in the Q&A box. Um, one thing I always like to ask to our speakers is if you haven't ended up working in this field, what else do you think you would have gone into in a different, in a different life? <laughs> Do you know that's an interesting question? I asked some, I asked my friend this the other day. Uh, mine would be, uh, I'd be an architect, I think. I really love how, how buildings are made. <laughs> but then it's uh, still a lot of math, so maybe I would have given up. But yes, no, an architect, I think. But. Um, we've had one question asking, is there a shortage of um, informaticians and is there likely to be like growth in opportunities in this, in this field in the sort of next five years or so? That is an excellent question. So at the moment, there is the training has been, uh, this is why the training has been really useful, but there has been a real uptake and training uptake um, from the pandemic. And I think it's a good thing. So this way we can split again the load. Will in projecting in five years, I think there'll be a lot of mathematicians, but um, the languages keep changing. So there's always going to be a job. So they said, you know, we, we used to write scripts on C++ and even old the things but nowadays it's python and once you've learned one language you can transfer across and i think it's keeping a pace is that i mean i'm more going into the management style so i think it's there'll always be a job for you especially if in i would say in computing because um health is going more into oh, sorry about the alarm again um health it's going into more health tech and personalized medicine so as these type of as the technology grows we'll need to grow with the, the expertise so Will there'll definitely be a job for you? Awesome. Um, and then one other question on a sort of slightly different note. Um, someone's asked, "What was your main passion of, as a child, and were you able to follow it?" Oh, passion. Oh, that's oh, passion in what set? Ah, uh, passion. Uh, I would say in terms of uh, academically, I guess. This was just get, get, yeah, yeah, whatever your interest was as a child. You spoke a bit about doing drama. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. So, yes. So, academically, yes, I've just stuck with what I, I really love. And again, that's when choosing your subjects, especially a PhD or any subject you do, even undergrad, definitely choose something you love, which is why I asked that question at the beginning. Um, I love biology. I'm always interested in how things work. So, do move with, go with that. Um, in terms of passions, I have stuck with, I had to drop art. Art was also at school because I couldn't take it into A levels. It's a lot of time and I couldn't have done those sort of um, 
intense geography and biology but i still do paint in my spare time i think it's fun it's a fun fun pastime and i'm not being examined on it which is great <laughs> awesome and just as we wrap up we've had one really nice comment from someone who's joined us from kenya um their name's alex and they're uh, pursuing a, a master's in bioinformatics um and they just they came along to hear your career journey so um yeah we've got people from all over the world joining us today which is oh. always nice to see Fantastic, Alex. I wish you the best of luck in your bioinformatics journey. Hopefully we'll, we'll cross paths at some point. Awesome. Um, and with that, that's, that's half five. So um, I know, Christine, you've got something else to do this evening. So um, we'll wrap up there. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, and as I said, any links and things that Christine talked about um, will be in the email you get from Eventbrite tomorrow. So if you miss bits, um, you'll be able to catch up on the recording and, and all of that. Um, when we send you the email tomorrow. But thank you very much, everyone, for joining us, and hopefully, we'll see you um, at our next talks. <laughs>